UCSF School of Medicine is, um, is uniquely prepared to lead the way in preparing what we call the 21st century physician uh, because we have uh, incredibly talented faculty uh, staff and actually really wonderful students who make up our community. It is the only medical school that is ranked in the top five in the country by US News and World Report, uh, both um, for primary care education and for research education. Um, and it is the leading organization in the country for NIH grants. So it's a real powerhouse and we feel very privileged to be able to uh, teach and educate our students here. Um, and uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of our also wonderful um, educational environment stems from the patients who share uh, their lives with us as we're educating the next generation of physicians. So um, I want to talk a little bit just briefly as, as part of our disclosures about the lenses through which we look as we are um, trying to educate the next generation of physicians. So I am a physician first and an educator second. As I said, I was an internal medicine resident here and I've practiced internal medicine um, for 30 years and deeply believe that every single person who comes to a physician either with an illness or fearful that they are ill is incredibly vulnerable and needs to be confident that whatever physician they choose, um, that physician is well trained and well suited to help them navigate um, their illness or their concerns. And so when I think about education, I think first and foremost about what do our patients need um, as we're preparing the next generation of physicians? What kind of new challenges will our patients bring to us as doctors? What kind of new strategies will our patients want to engage with us as uh, new physicians? Um, and then how do we make sure that that we help our um, medical students, residents, and eventually our practicing physicians continuously improve their skills and, and uh, remain responsive and patient-centered throughout careers that, you, as you may realize, may last 30 or 40 years. Uh, very, very dynamic time. But we also believe um, really in the power of enhancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in our environments, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, because our uh, society has become increasingly diverse and, um, and and wonderfully so. Um, and the enriching um, capability of diverse populations for our society in all domains, whether it's education, music, the arts, science, or medicine is really powerful. And UCSF has led the way in ensuring that we are preparing not just individuals, but a workforce capable of meeting the needs of a very diverse population. So we begin um, our curriculum redesign, and as I said, a curriculum is just an overarching plan to decide how students will spend time in medical school to become the type of doctors that you would want to care for someone that you loved if they were sick. Um, so it requires that we think a little bit about how much time do we have not that long, about four years for a medical school career, um, how many things do we have to teach huge amounts of things, um, which becomes a real challenge. Um, but a most important thing we want to say is what are we trying to accomplish? Um, and so we began our curriculum journey uh, encouraging people to believe that the purpose of medical education is really to improve the health of our communities and to decrease the burden of suffering from illness and disease for our patients. Uh, and that's um, a much broader goal than just saying we want to recruit a lot of really talented individuals and help them enter into the profession of medicine. We really believe that the work we do in education is, is and should be designed to make care better right now for the students and residents that are uh, caring for our patients in the hospital right now and then care better in the future. Many of you may be aware uh, that the first era in American medical education started in 19, between 1910 and 1914 when there was kind of a revolution that occurred. And this revolution occurred because Andrew Carnegie, who was a um, steel magnet, um, some people would call him a robber baron, had a bunch of money um, and wanted to do something to improve society and decided that medical um, education was something that deserved um, greater scrutiny because there was a famous aphorism about that time that said that a patient who um, came in contact with a physician in 1910 
had a 50-50 chance of leaving that encounter uh, better than when they came in. Uh, we just didn't really know that much about uh, how science translated into medicine at that time. And uh, what Carnegie did was he commissioned a social scientist, Abraham Flexner, and you might hear that name if you ever read historically about medical education, um, to go around and evaluate the 175 or 176 medical schools in operation in the early um, 20th century. And Flexner's report um, was scathing. He said that the state of medical education in the United States was tremendously bad. Um, and it was um, unfettered, it was unregulated, it was unstandardized, and it was non-scientific. And so as a result of this report, where he not only criticized many, many medical schools, but actually said the important thing we needed to do was return uh, medical education to the university and not just let anybody who felt like it put, you know, have a medical school that popped up like on Ninth and Irving, which is what they used to do, um, that we needed some standards, we needed to bring it back to the university, um, and we needed to actually enroll and graduate only those students who were capable of mastering uh, medical science at the time. And as a result of his um, report, um, about a third of those American medical schools closed almost immediately um, as, as being now considered to be substandard. When Flexner started, he basically said, okay, well, foundational science is changing the germ theory. This is um, a picture of a, a microbiology um, Petri dish on the left-hand side, had just been espoused. And most people, when they thought about foundational sciences for phys physicians, thought about things that you might recognize as being critical for physicians to understand, anatomy, uh, pharmacology, how drugs work, physiology, how do the various organs uh, work, pathology, what do cells look like and tissues look like when they become diseased, um, uh, and other types of really basic biomedical science were the types of science that um, we um, focused our energies in educating our students with because that was the emerging science of the time. It's hard for us to imagine this, but before the early 20th century, um, most people didn't have any understanding about what science looked like other than physics um, and a little bit of chemistry. And so what we saw was foundational science at that time was pretty straightforward, pretty biomedical, and there was a general belief that there was probably a single etiology for every single disease that existed, just one. And if we could just find that one etiology for each disease, we could probably find the one medication that might fix it and then the patient would be cured. Now, of course, foundational science is much more complex because it's not just at this microbial level. We can dive deep down into the cell um, and into subcellular elements like genetics and genomics and protein synthesis. Um, and so the a complexity of science today in the beginning of the 21st century is hugely different than it was at the beginning of the 20th century. And that's important because when we begin to think about the four-year medical school curriculum, that existed in the 20th century. And now I'm suggesting that not only do we have to teach this microbiology stuff, which was Dr. Davis's favorite work, um, but we have to go deeper into the cells and understand how cells um, contribute to the formation of disease and cures. Our views of disease have really changed as well. Um, as I mentioned, in the early 20th century, and this was somewhat based on the scientific method at the time, which really looked uh, at what we would call reductionist, as I said, one, one disease, one etiology or cause, and one type of cure that might be possible. Um, that was sort of the belief that we'd, we'd find that magic bullet for almost every disease, and, and early advances in medical education and biomedical science really showed that. So, for example, um, in the early 1900s was when we realized that diabetes occurred because of a deficiency of insulin um, and that if we just gave some patients with type 1 diabetes, that's what we used to call juvenile onset diabetes, a shot of insulin, um, they would um, miraculously recover, at least for a while. Um, my favorite example from the early 20th century is this um, poster about penicillin curing gonorrhea in four hours. This was another thing where we figured out what caused gonorrhea and we knew what the treatment was, just a simple shot of penicillin, which we were able to um, basically distribute by about 
about 1930, 1935. But I think this is a really interesting picture. If you can sort of imagine like how common gonorrhea must have been um, and how easy it was for patients to diagnose themselves if you would just be walking down the street and you'd see this like poster on the, on the side next to a fire plug. Well, what happened in terms of the burden of illness is all of those diseases that were easy to solve with a single shot of something, whether it was insulin or penicillin or another common tonic at that time was uh, vitamin B12, um, nutritional supplementation, um, we actually learned how to cure all of those diseases. And in fact, things that used to cause people to die early on, acute infectious diseases, acute nutritional deficiencies, became something that we could um, treat effectively and allow people to live longer. But what happens when people live longer? they become susceptible to more diseases, right? As you age, you get exposed to um, lots of different conditions that may be a result of aging or cumulative exposure to toxins in the environment um, or lifestyle choices that you make. And so as people lived into the later 20th century um, to greater and greater ages, and we, be a we were able to change uh, like we did HIV from acute, acutely fatal disease to something that's chronic, we did the same thing for things like diabetes and heart failure and chronic kidney disease and chronic lung disease and cancers. All of these um, conditions were at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century um, acutely fatal. And by the end of the 20th century, people were living with them. So disease looked a lot different. It wasn't just one disease that you were looking for a shot to cure, but you had multiple complex chronic diseases. And what we began to realize is this picture on the right-hand side, our vision of disease has changed quite dramatically. We now understand that most diseases, and this is, I don't expect you to read this, just look at the complexity. This is a chart that um, uh, elucidates the complex web of connected um, disruptions that contribute to the development of breast cancer that occurs after menopause. And so we see it's not just um, estrogens in the water, but it's sometimes things related to genetic abnormality and social decisions that people make, behavioral decisions that people make, and things like that. So our, our um, foundational, what we understand about foundational science changed, and what we understood about the nature of disease and illness changed as well over the 20th century. Now, this is no surprise to you, but the way we find and disseminate information has changed pretty uh, dramatically. So in the early 20, 2000s, or in the early, I'm sorry, the early um, 1900s, the doctor was the only one with a book. Right? There was no ability for people to go Google things. There was no ability for people to go to a mini medical school. They didn't have such a thing there. Um, so if you really wanted medical information, the only way you got it was through the mind and the lips of the physician that you engaged with. And this was actually even true when you look at other health professionals. Much of the knowledge actually came through the physician's um, mind and wasn't particularly um, shaped by the way the physicians looked at the world. And Physicians at that time wrote a lot about case studies to help our understand how our patients were faring underneath various treatments we were experimenting with. This on the left-hand side is the index medicate. It, is the, it used to be the way we looked up articles in the biomedical literature to figure out what we might treat our patients with. Um, and while this comes from um, very, very early, sort of early, just turn of the century, around 1900, um, I will tell you that as late as 1980, when I was here at UCSF, this is how we found literature. So we would go and we'd look up each of these things for several years in a row to see if we could find some article that might help us with the patient in front of us. Just imagine, it's sort of like the Encyclopedia Britannica of medicine, and that's how we often made decisions. Now, of course, um, we have the ability to um, not only find information at our fingertips, but disseminate it very quickly as soon as we can discover what might be contributing to illness or suffering in the patients that we have in our communities. And even more, information has become so democratically available that patients can also engage with their physicians, having read much of the same literature that, that we do. So it's a, it's a real game changer in the way that we learn and keep up with our environment, but also it has fundamentally changed the way physicians interact with patients and the way physicians act, interact with other health professionals. And the way we deliver care has changed really quite dramatically. 
So on the left-hand side, you see a very iconic photo of a family doctor um, trudging across a field, um, carrying his, and it was almost always a him, his black bag. Um, and he's always, in, physicians from this age were always identified and portrayed as individuals. And we call these the hero physicians because they knew all and um, ordered all, right? So it was easier to do them because virtually every therapy and every diagnostic tool that a physician had available to them could fit in this little black bag. Until really about 1950, um, the amount of tr therapies that a physician had at their disposal could really be counted on, on two hands or, or less. And if you don't really believe this, recall that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, a as a president of the United States, arguably had access to the very, very best medical care available. And when he died, he died of untreated hypertension, having only been treated with a couple of medications, neither of which actually are very good blood pressure medications. And so this is just, it was, you know, when, when the amount of knowledge you have is limited and the amount of technology you have is limited and the therapeutic agents you have is limited, it's easy to be the single best of everything. And so you see a lot of this. But there are storms in the background for this physician. Um, because again, as biomedical science advanced through the 20th century, largely because of the work of really dedicated physicians and scientists supported through our National Institutes of Health funded uh, research program, um, things, we began to keep people long, alive longer, things that used to kill them no longer killed them, um, and we realized that it was no longer sufficient for physicians to be um, totally independent. In fact, they had to be interdependent, and you see on the right-hand side a much more typical uh, physician, uh, in, physician engaged team uh, that you might see in the 21st century. And while this is in, in a hospital setting, and it appears to be even in an intensive care unit, um, we even see this in the outpatient environments as well. So even if you see your physician as a solitary care provider in an office, behind the scenes, he or she most likely has a team of individuals who are working with them, which was not the case in the early 20th century. Our students have changed quite dramatically as well. Um, on the left, you see a class from about 1950 um, uh, at UCSF. And I will tell you that for this era, this class in 1950 is strikingly gender diverse. Um, and because if you look carefully, you can count four women um, in the class. That was at that time um, amazing gender diversity. You see, um, if you look carefully, zero um, physicians of color in these pictures, right? Um, but you look now, and the diversity of students who are coming to us and who are choosing careers in medicine has really dramatically increased and has improved our environment substantially. Right now, across the United States, um, 50 to 51 percent of all medical students entering in 2017 are women. At UCSF, that number this year was 56% of the class entering was women. Um, across the country, about um, 15 to 18% of matriculating students represent students of color. At UCSF, that number is about 34% um, represent students of color. Um, our students who enter here are slightly older than uh, what you would have seen in the 1950s because in the 1950s there was this um, real push to complete your education and that continued through the 60s and 70s um, in large result because of the different wars that occurred at that time. The Berry Plan allowed people to sort of defer if they went to school but they wanted them to get out into, um, into practice very quickly so they could care for all of the returning veterans. Um, so virtually everyone just went to college and then quickly went to medical school. Now we see um, students uh, taking the time to actually uh, do service work in between medical school, in between college and medical school, um, and actually um, some of them even getting advanced degrees before they enter medical school. And our understanding of how learners learn best has also changed. So in the early 1900s, and some of you may re remember some of these classrooms, I can see the, the light is very bright, but there's a few people who look to be sort of maybe my age or so. Um, but um, this was pretty classic. Was This is what we used to call amphitheater type learning. So these are all uh, medical students. Uh, they're men uh, for the most part, and they're watching a physician interact with a patient down there. Virtually all learning in medical education up until about 19 
1985 or so was classroom based until students um, entered uh, clinical environments in the third and fourth year. Now our students at the very beginning start off um, working with patients from virtually the first week of medical school and will continue to work with patients throughout the four years of medical school and into their residency. Um, also the learning is much more active. Uh, we know that in fact learning is a whole body experience. Uh, people who move and think and interact and engage with the material um, learn much more rapidly than those who just sit and attempt to listen and memorize from the classroom. And the last thing I will say is um, about differences in the way we think about medicine is our understanding of many, uh, the root cause of many critical issues has changed. Uh, and in, in addition to thinking about physicians as having to understand biomedical science and the way in which we diagnose and treat disease, we also believe they have a responsibility given the fact that we work within these big healthcare systems with other professionals and administrators to serve our patients and communities. We have the capacity now and are obliged to learn how to effectively measure um, whether or not the care we're giving is safe, high quality, equitable, um, reliable, and high value. And so this is another set of tools and um, sciences that our physicians need to master. Now what hasn't changed? Um, our patients in many ways have not changed um, that much. They still come to us um, wanting our help in restoring them to health or alleviating their fears about um, illness that they may or may not have. And so in that way, the need for having a compassionate, patient-centered physician who is willing to um, talk with you and understand your concerns and address them appropriately has really been an enduring um, capacity and responsibility of physicians. Um, but for patients, as I alluded to earlier, have also changed to some extent because no longer do they just take orders from physicians and no longer do they just rely on whatever the physician said as God's own truth. Um, they are informed, engaged, they monitor their own health, they actually learn what works for them sometimes from a therapeutic perspective um, and they, they expect to and, and thrive when they have a true partnership with a physician which would have been horrendously foreign uh, to the physicians back 100 years ago. So I'm going to turn it over to John because the reason I've spent this time talking about the difference between 100 years ago and now is because the dominant mode of medical education that started with Flexner's revolution in 1914 actually has endured to this day. And over the past decade, I would say, people have begun to say, the world is much different. Why are we continuing to educate physicians the way we did? when we were looking at predominantly acute disease with limited biomedical science in an information poor environment, our patients and other health professionals expected to be in many ways subservient to physicians. We need a new type of a physician. And so when we came um, to UCSF a few years ago, our faculty got together and said, let's rethink the best way to educate the physicians that we need so that we can um, meet the needs of our public and our patients for, for high quality health care and improved health. So I'll turn this over to John and let him talk about um, how we've redesigned the curriculum. So thank you, Dr. Lucy. And uh, so my name is John Davis. I'm the Associate Dean for Curriculum here. And uh, clinically, I do infectious diseases, as, as you heard Dr. Lucy mention. Um, and I just joined here um, at UCSF. Um, from Ohio State University um, in July. So um, what I'm talking about here is about the new curriculum that, that has been designed, um, but understand that I'm really um, telling you about all the wonderful things that, um, that amazing people here have done. So, um, so as you just heard Dr. Lucy talking about, we talked a lot about change and what has changed over time. Changed enough that we really need to re-envision how we educate medical students. And, and we have to start with a few, um, a few things that we want to do when we're planning out uh, a curriculum for them. So first we ask ourselves, what is it we want to achieve? So we first of all want to pro provide society with physicians who provide excellent health care, right? Um, we would also like to have these people be leaders, advancing science and, and pushing knowledge forward. At the same time, we, we recognize where we are 
UCSF is an amazing place that has had an opportunity to advance science on its own. Um, and we have lots of people who've done amazing things in their fields. And so that's something we should be able to capture and take advantage of on behalf of our students and to educate them. And then lastly, how do we do all of this learning that we need to do for the, the students? How do we help them with that? And at the same time, minimize some of the negative impact. Um, how do we keep an eye on their well-being to make sure that we are doing actually both of those? And then maybe even consider the other educators, right? So the faculty who are here um, and help support them in this process. So our, our fundamental premise was that one should easily be able to recognize a UCSF graduate by the way they approach the three things, patients, problems, and populations. So again, understanding that a lot of what we do as physicians is interacting one-on-one -on -one with patients. At the same time, in many instances, we are bringing to our physicians things that we would like addressed. And so we want to make sure that our physicians know about the different problems that we have. And understanding that, that diseases and other things don't just happen on a person-by-person -person basis, but also happen in a population sense. And so the way we do that is by uh, embracing the concept of enduring and emerging competencies. Um, and so when you think about the word competency, it, uh, it sounds like competent and, and incompetent. Um, and we kind of do and kind of don't mean that in exactly that way. What we like to do is think about how we want a physician to be. What do we want the ideal physician to do? And that's how we help to design a curriculum. So we take that a little bit further and we articulate exactly what we think our physicians, our graduating students, um, should believe in. So the essential role of the physician as healer, again, as you heard Dr. Lucy mention, um, we're physicians first, and that is important. Um, and we should be able to meet the needs of a diverse population of patients. At the same time, we talked about science before and how science has changed. And so the UCSF physician believes in the imperative of advancing science and doing it for a particular purpose, that is to reduce the burden of suffering from illness and disease. At the same time, the UCSF physician believes in the obligation to measure and continuously improve the quality of health care. And that's health care for all. So how do we, how do we engage um, our students in starting, to, starting to down that pathway? Um, the UCSF physician believes in, as you heard discussed before, about how teams have changed, the vitality of interprofessional and inter interdisciplinary teams. No longer is the physician practicing alone, but now how do we make sure that our students have the ability to interact with other team members in an appropriate way that helps to do those things that have come before? And lastly, um, the UCSF physician believes in the urgency of eliminating disparities in health, health care, and opportunity. So acting as change agents for social justice. So this requires um, uh, a lot of different things of our medical students. So the curriculum itself had to be designed to take into account multiple domains of science. Once upon a time, at the time Flexner was writing his report around uh, the turn of uh, the 20th century, he was thinking more about biomedical science. How do you, how do you understand drugs? How do you understand um, infections and illnesses that, that you could understand at the time um, and things of that nature? We now know more about science and we know so much that, that science itself has, has spread into different specialty areas. And this slide illustrates some of those specialty areas. That includes things like the biomedical sciences, but then not only that, how do those biomedical sciences become things that actually help people? That's clinical and translational sciences. How do we study populations? And there are two different ways we can do that, so epidemiology and population sciences. At the same time, science also looks at how people behave. And so a lot of that has to do with social and behavioral sciences. And everything from education to how we interact with technology to how we make healthcare safer are other domains such as uh, implementation sciences and informatics and technology. So we have to acknowledge that we have a lot of stuff to teach medical students now, right? So we've got a lot going on. At the same time, we know that ultimately we want to distill it into three main things. That is, we want to help start our students down a pathway of learning. Um, so one, one quote that, um, that is commonly talked about here is, I think one's attributed to, um, to William Butler Yeats, that is that, that 
learning and education is less about filling some kind of vessel with information and more about about igniting a fire um, in someone. And that's what we have to view ourselves as doing. When we're here, we've got four years with them or so um, as part of a 30 plus year career. So we're really just starting the process. And what we really want to do is, is give them habits of mind that are gonna serve them well going forward. So the first is inquiry, making sure that they are actively seeking information and incorporating it as, as time goes on. The second is the orientation to patient-centered um, continuous quality improvement. How do we make ourselves and the system better? And the third, as I talked about before, is social justice. So how do we now start doing that? Well, so, so this has come together in our curriculum um, in what we call the Bridges Curriculum. Uh, again, and that is symbolic and metaphoric in many different ways, um, but this was a curriculum that took five years worth of work and is still ongoing, and over 400 faculty, staff, and students have contributed to it to help um, elucidate its different uh, parts and pieces. We won't go through all of it here. I will uh, admit to you all that I am a confessed education nerd, um, and I do love curriculum design. This stuff is a lot of fun for me. Um, but what I really want to get across to you is how we've thought about those different things to help take students um, sort of to their next level. So distilling the curriculum down into its core pieces, um, there are three different phases students go through over their four or so years here. Um, we call them Foundations One, Foundations Two, and Career Launch. And they, they each have slightly different purposes and slightly different designs to achieve those. But what this slide illustrates is while that happens over the course of time, there are some threads that last throughout, and those are listed on the bottom half of the slide. So that includes the concept of science, and in particular foundational science, and understanding that no matter where you are in the course of your curriculum, there is something about science that applies to what you're doing, and how do we weave that in? At the same time, clinical skills and systems improvement is important. How do students continue to ask questions about how they make themselves better and how they make the system better? And that's applicable at all stages of their curriculum. And inquiry, innovation, and discovery. So making sure that students start asking questions, critical questions of knowledge, what they do know, what they don't know, what to, what to find out next. So as you might imagine, I, I, I put this up as, as a way of illustrating what it looks like from a week standpoint or a day-to-day -day kind of standpoint, the students are doing a lot of stuff. Uh, it doesn't happen naturally that you are able to, to um, just sort of throw things um, into a week and hope that students are able to cultivate some of these habits of mind and learn the stuff that they need to learn. Um, this is an example of a week that's taken from uh, when the students are learning about kidney disease and um, stomach-related illnesses and nutrition. And so they're doing a lot of lectures on things like diuretics um, uh, or water pills, as some call them, um, kidney disease in particular, and you can see some of these things that are happening. They're color-coded to let them know what the types of activities are and what they pertain to. But they have things that are illustrated here, for instance, about inquiry, where we actually take time in the curriculum to help teach students how to ask questions. And then the CMC time is, we'll get to in a bit about um, the clinical microsystems clerkship, wherein we teach them about how to ask questions about improving healthcare and improving the system. Um, there they participate as, as learning about um, physical exam and, and talking to patients and talking with each other, but at the same time they're also learning about how to make systems better. And we also have throughout all of this, as, as you heard mentioned earlier, the thoughts about education and that actually we're kind of violating some of that now because we know that when we sit up here and lecture to people that they may retain a, a smaller amount of what we say. And so we engage for our students um, in lots of small group activities where they are interacting with each other and grappling with ideas together where we know they're going to learn a lot better. Um, and, and what we also like to do is rather than have um, a lot of lectures as there used to be once upon a time, we now know about this thing called the flipped classroom where students learn better when they get a chance to review lectures on their own 
And then when they come together in class, they're gonna talk about that lecture that they watched. You know what, well I saw this and this looked interesting, but I didn't understand this, this slide. And, and the person said this, what did you think that meant? And when they interact that way, they learn a lot better. So that's what has been incorporated as, as part of our curriculum to help make sure that students learn better. So taking some of these um, uh, different elements uh, one by one. First, the inquiry curriculum, which we often refer to as the anti-medical school, mostly because medical school, at least once upon a time, was about teaching you the facts that you need to know. So we're going to throw all of these facts, you're going to drink from the fire hose and memorize a bunch of stuff, and you're going to spit that back to us on a test at some point when we ask you lots of questions. Um, and this is really about the stuff that that medical schools didn't teach you, or more importantly, that medical schools don't even know. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know. We're learning about things every single day, and how do we get our students ready to be those people who will learn the new things, who will discover those new things? So really, we're, we're helping to cultivate their ability to identify and seek insights into really the unanswered questions in medicine and healthcare, again, in all of those domains of science we talked about. And we do that um, starting first with modeling for them. We help show them how to critically uh, ask questions in core inquiry cases. We give them chances to start exploring a little bit about, um, about their own inquiry in different subjects, and, and that's what we call inquiry immersion blocks, where they get a chance to, to take a deeper dive into certain subjects. And then by the end of their medical school time, they will be completing a, a scholarly project where they choose their own thing that they're interested in and take that to, to sort of the next level. So, um, so they're actually engaging in a lot of that. The clinical microsystems clerkship and that curriculum is something I mentioned before. So this is a really novel part of the curriculum as well. I will tell you that, that um, here the, the first days that a medical student is in a clinic setting are first spent observing and really starting to ask, just watching what goes on and asking the fundamental questions of what didn't go well. How might we make something better? What went well but could be even better? Um, and so they start their experience in healthcare by asking how to make things better. So students are longitudinally um, assigned to a particular um, a care delivery site and they will be there for the next 18 months. Um, they become valuable members of that team. Because they start by observing and finding out how to make things better, the next thing they get to do is to make that better. And so they embark on projects that help improve the quality of care and the functioning of the system that they're in. And this has led to, um, to the students being even more valuable participants in the healthcare uh, process. At the same time, they are watching and learning the clinical skills. Um, they are learning those in simulation first. So we have an amazing simulation center here where students get a chance to practice things um, on um, patient actors um, and on uh, for procedures on mannequins, for instance. Um, so they get a chance to really practice things uh, beforehand and demonstrate that they are proficient before they start um, interacting with patients. Um, but then at the same time, they're able to do a lot of this work um, in that particular setting. So um, we've actually had some great success. With our, um, our first class of students who, um, who have gone through the Bridges curriculum have presented their work on um, the clinical microsystems that they've done on the improvement projects that they have done. And on this slide, there are a few of the topics that they've looked at. So things like um, uh, preoperative conditions of geriatric patients, um, appropriate use of Narcan in patients who are using opioids, um, and increased documentation of end-of-life planning conversations. These are our two students who worked on, in particular, that middle uh, project about Narcan. Um, and, um, and, and now they've had a chance to, to do these presentations at many of the different health systems where they've been involved. Um, and be able to demonstrate some of the value that they are bringing to patient care and to the health system overall. Uh, and it's been very, very well received. I, I mentioned before social justice um, and um, our public mission. So, um, so honoring that public mission and that commitment to social justice and health equity and eliminating health care um, disparities and equities. Um, so we have done a lot of work on that in our curriculum, starting 
uh, at the very beginning with what we call our content exemplars. In other words, it was important to us to understand what the healthcare burden was and what diseases are most common here in the Bay Area. Um, and again, because of the size of San Francisco being 49 square miles, that we picked the UCSF 49. Um, and those were the 49 common syndromes um, and illnesses that we see. And so understanding that our students have a curriculum that is anchored in those particular conditions so that they are uniquely poised to care for the community of San Francisco. Um, at the same time, there is a community service um, rotation that students do during orientation. Um, and they will have community service that comes back at the end of their curriculum. Um, and we included two content blocks to help teach students specifically about how we think about social justice. We talk about health in the individual and health in society, and we really give students a chance to explore in depth about diversity and identity and how those concepts interact with medicine and healthcare, um, and sometimes in not so positive ways. So we study healthcare disparities and how we can change to make things better. Um, uh, and, and in terms of anticipating advances, one of the um, elements of the curriculum that students experience toward the end of their very first phase is something called the DR block or the data and reasoning block. And this is something where physicians now need to learn how to interact with the computer. Um, in, in many instances before, um, physicians sort of viewed the computer as their enemy. Um, in I, when I went to medical school, I wrote in paper charts and we had to go look things up. I too remember Index Medicus and, and the Science Citation Index. So I remember going to the library and looking things up. Uh, no longer. And now that there are electronic medical and health records, um, Patients often have access to their own charts and are able to see things. Patients are able to interact with their providers um, electronically. And we need to know how to use those systems and actually use them to provide better care. And so this is one of the blocks where, um, where students will learn how to optimize that interface between humans and computers, um, really with the end goal of making sure that patient care is improved. Um, and one of the other uh, novel pieces of our curriculum is what's called the coaching project. So I mentioned before how we want to make sure that we help our students learn, but at the same time, we want to make sure we're looking after their well-being, because it can be stressful to learn all of this stuff and to do all of this stuff. So one of the things that we've programmed in is the coaching project, where um, students in groups of about six are assigned to one faculty person um, who will serve as their coach um, over the course of their time in medical school. So they get to know that person well during our orientation time. Um, and then they will help the student as the student goes through and learns about what they're doing in the curriculum. So the coaches already know about the curriculum, but students figure out how they're doing. They come from very different places. They come from different learning styles. They come from different backgrounds. They come with lots of different strengths, and they want to do well in the curriculum. And the coaches are there to help them say, OK, well, tell me about how you're doing, and let's see how we can help you do better. And so here are some, some pictures of our coaches interacting with their students um, to help them review their own progress. And it, in particular, what we really want to instill in our students is the ability to sort of hear that coach's voice going forward. In other words, cultivating that habit of self-improvement and their own problem-based learning and improvement to be able to say, OK, you know what? I, I don't know that I knew this as well as I should. I'd like to go learn more about that. You know, here's something I really could do better at. This is a skill I'd like to acquire. Let, let me figure out how I'm going to go do that. Because that is what will help them be lifelong learners going forward. And at the same time, what we found as one of the big successes of the coaching program is that that mentorship relationship that the students are in is incredibly valuable. Um, they look at their coaches as trusted confidants and people who really help guide them through life and help them understand their lives as physicians going forward. So, um, so this has been a really, really successful, successful project.
So as you can imagine, so I've talked now about the curriculum, about all, lots of different pieces of it. Um, these pieces don't just sort of fall together naturally. It requires some coordination um, and it requires some change management. And so um, for that, I will invite Dr. Lucy back up um, to talk a little bit about how this, um, this new curriculum got launched. Thank you, John. So one of the things that may be going through your head is why did it take 100 years to sort of readopt um, medical education? And I don't want to mislead you and say nothing changed from 1914 to 2010 or 2011. Along the way, um, all medical schools were engaging in some what we would call evolutionary change. And that is we would say, well, you know, um, maybe we have to start teaching about psychology now. So we're going to cut down biochemistry by a couple of hours and put in a couple of hours of lectures of psychology. Or um, HIV came on board, and we, we needed to teach people not only how to care for patients with diabetes and high blood pressure and congestive heart failure and cancer, but we also needed to expose the students to the new medications and diagnostic tests that were used to um, evaluate and manage patients with HIV. So along the way, uh, medical schools have been keeping up with um, changes in biomedical science, but fundamentally maintaining the same structure and processes uh, that were in place or, uh, since the time of Flexner. Now, why is that? Because change is hard. Um, and in fact, the changes we've been talking about today, rethinking the role and responsibilities of a physician, really explicating um, how a physician interacts with patients today in a different way than they did even 20 years ago or actually 30 years ago when I first started my career. Um, and what our obligations are to our society to make sure that the care our patients receive um, is patient-centered, safe, high quality, effective, and high value. Um, that really requires us not just to tweak things along the way and add an hour of something here and take away an hour of something there. It required us really to fundamentally change the structure and function of medical education. As John mentioned, our, this new curriculum is three phases. It's delivered over four years. Um, that's in itself structurally different because medical education for 100 years has been two years of classroom training followed by two years of clinical training. Um, in addition to that um, new three-phase approach, all of the elements are integrated throughout the entirety of the curriculum. So you don't just stop learning science after year two. You actually continuously learn science throughout the same four years. Um, Making these wholesale changes in the way we teach students um, can't be done in isolation because the way medical students are taught is by practicing physicians who are on the faculty here at UCSF and within the larger community of practicing physicians in the North, um, Northern California Bay Area. Um, and so you might see immediately that that requires us to sort of think about, well, these physicians were educated in a different era so not only do we have to train the new students in a different way, we have to retrain those other physicians. Um, and many people have likened curriculum redesign to um, rebuilding the airplane while you're flying the airplane. Because in addition to training the students and training the faculty in new um, modes of education as well as new modes of science, you're taking care of patients. Um, and interacting with communities. So um, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, but just ex explaining that I think helps you understand why curriculum redesign, revolutionary curriculum design, or transformative curriculum di design doesn't happen every year. Um, it has to happen over time, and it has to happen as, as a function of a large community. We can't, as much as we sometimes wish we could, um, just come in one day and sort of say, OK, we're changing all the courses. Get ready and teach something new. We have to engage people. Uh, and the way we engage people, um, first off, and those of you who are change management um, gurus, first off, we had to convince our community that we needed to change. Unless you sort of point out to them the gap between our current reality of how physicians are trained and where we think the future ideal needs to be, there's no driving force to change. So you have to actually know um, that there's something that we want to change. And our community came together in many different um, areas and actually talked really honestly and openly about healthcare experiences we had had 
um, as the, both the providing physician, but also as patients or as um, loved ones of patients. And we ask people to sort of compare how were the experiences you've had as a provider and as a patient or a patient's loved one compare with what you think is the ideal? And, and what were the deficiencies and what were the things that we needed to reinforce throughout that? So we came together with a, a very communal purpose and set our sights high in a really ambitious redesign. Um, and we got people from around the country to work with us on this. So um, through um, many of our scientific meetings and the literature that we write, um, other people began to say, yeah, we think they're onto something. We think we do need to really rethink the way physicians interact with patients and other health professionals. We used um, a very scholarly approach. So one of the things we wanted to do was build on the success of education at UCSF and other medical schools, how we know uh, the things we know about how someone starts off being a young college student and within 10 years is now a sophisticated physician. We know a lot about how that maturation takes place ideally. We also know about what happens when it gets stalled, what it looks like and how we can jumpstart that. So we wanted to build on what we already knew. And we wanted to make sure we were engaging everyone, not just people who are passionate about education, but people who are passionate and actively involved in taking care of patients, and people who are passionate and actively involved in discovering uh, new biomedical advances. And we talked to our patients as well as to people who are advocates for them. We started um, doing a very data-driven participatory design, so we had to actually um, uh, involve a lot of people because we're literally sort of turning an aircraft carrier. It's another sort of, you know, big, big um, transportation metaphor. Um, but literally what we did is rather than just say we're going to design this perfectly on paper and then um, one day flip a switch and implement the new curriculum, the reason it took us four years uh, or five years to get this launched was that we tested every new idea that we had with small groups, we call those pilot studies um, or proof of concept studies, with small groups of students and faculty to see how it worked in the real world so that we could actually get the bugs out, sort of like a beta test before you would launch a new software design. Um, Embrace of criticism was really important. Um, in all change management, there's a phase that people go through called the trough of disillusionment. So you start off with a really extremely exciting, we're going to do this, we're going to change the world, and things are going to be much better for our patients and our communities and our doctors um, and everyone who works here. And people start working, they're working really hard. And then all of a sudden, um, people run out of steam. And you know we call this the trough of disillusionment because it's so predictable, it happens. And, and what's happening is people are starting to saying, wow, this really is a big change. It's gonna require that I rethink my role here. It's a lot of work. Maybe things were fine. Um, maybe we could just go back to the old curriculum. And, and, and you know, I didn't really like that, that idea anyway. So there's a lot of sort of, you know, about, about uh, just about a year into this process, very predictively, we hit this trough of disillusionment um, and began to feel a little resistance. And what we found is that the resistance actually um, made us sort of regroup and rethink about our purpose. Was that really still valid? And the answer was yes. We still wanted to strive towards this new role of a physician to help our patients. Um, and then we, um, and then, but then we found a whole bunch of new ideas that energize the environment. So uh, embrace of criticism because it energizes and also it's a gift that shows you you might have taken made one bad decision that was going to be amplified if you didn't stop and rethink. Um, we received a lot of financial support to do this work because um, as we are doing this redesign work, students were still and have continued to exist in what we call the traditional curriculum. We don't call it the old curriculum because no one wants to be in the old curriculum. They always want to be in the modern, exciting, new curriculum. So the traditional curriculum, um, we were educating students as we were designing this new, new curriculum and we had to bring in more people and support their time to do that. And we were fortunate enough to get uh, financial support both from within our institution, the chairs of the departments of uh, medicine, surgery, pharmacology, um, psychiatry, all of the departments actually contributed to provide support to help us redesign this curriculum as a show of faith. And we also received financial support from the American Medical Association. Um, and in the end, um, it's really fundamentally about also communication and keeping people updated. Um, but um, 
but we've launched, um, we are um, about to launch the first class into the second phase of their curriculum. So we've done gone one class entirely through the first phase and the first class is now entering the second phase and they'll enter the third phase, phase next year. And, and we've learned a lot along the way and have continued to tweak and redesign. Um, how will we know if we're successful? It's one of the most common questions we get. Um, we are striving to change the way physicians interact with our patients and with our systems in a way that is beneficial to our patients. That's our driving force, it's our, it's our North Star. This is what we feel deeply committed to being and doing um, as professionals who actually work both in medicine and in education. So of course we'll look at um, student satisfaction and performance. We have to make sure that they can pass through medical school and learn all of these new things. They have to pass licensing exams so they can continue on with their education. We have to make sure that the faculty are happy in their roles otherwise um, you, you never want a cranky teacher and so uh, making sure that faculty are happy and faculty are happy when their career as an educator also contributes to their career advancement as a professor. Um, we have lots of educational outcome mes metrics that also looks at how people are choosing their residencies, what type of physicians they want to be. But probably the most novel thing that we have done with this curriculum that is true to our North Star is we are looking at um, changes in healthcare delivery that result um, today because of the way we are educating our students. And we are already seeing that the first year medical students with very little scientific knowledge yet, but ability to roll up their sleeves, ask patients how they're doing, figure out what's not working for the patient and their family, and propose solutions are already making dramatic changes in the quality of care um, that we are giving to our patients in our clinical environments, and the um, experience of our patients is improving as well, and we're using that as valid metrics uh, for our success. It isn't as though care was bad before, um, but what we are trying to do is to really aim for ideal care delivery for every single patient, um, and making sure that with this medical student workforce, we deploy them in a way that's compatible with, with the work that needs to be done, and they learn to work in teams um, as part of their core responsibilities. We think we've been successful. So we're going to stop there. Um, this is our tagline, the UCSF Bridges curriculum. We chose Bridges, of course, because of the iconic um, San Francisco landscape, but because of the bridges we were trying to create within the curriculum. We wanted to bridge um, education of medical students with education of all other health professionals, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, social workers, psychologists, um, anyone who actually works and cares for patients on teams with us. We wanted to bridge the gap between um, education of our patients, education of our students and the delivery High qual of high quality care for our patients. We wanted to bridge the gap between education of our students and the way we research. Um, and we wanted to bridge um, UCSF to all of the other medical schools in the country. So this, this became a movement across the nation, not just um, limited to the Bay Area. Um, and so um, we are working one bridge at a time and very delighted that you were willing to come and listen to our curriculum presentation tonight. So enjoy the rest of your um, week and we really appreciate your um, engagement with us for the Many Medical School.